The first question I see in the box is that I'm seeing more the ill will and jealousy towards others is the suffering of my own... Sorry, sometimes it's hard to... Okay. I'm seeing more the ill will and jealousy towards others is the suffering of my own mind and that the other or outside conditions are merely a trigger. However, I'm still caught in the pattern of thinking in such ways towards some people, even if not acting on it. We've met it said that if you direct it out, people will feel it. Similarly, can ill will still be felt by someone even if they're not geographically located nearby? Thank you. That's an interesting question. Okay. So it's wonderful that you're starting to notice that the ill will and jealousy is actually an internal thing and it's not actually caused by others, it's just an internal trigger. So I think it's really helpful in this case to start looking at what is causing that jealousy and that ill will. You know, what are the causes within you? And often, as I said earlier, I think a large part of it can be a lack of self-worth or um, a feeling of lack or perhaps just overlooking the blessings that we have in our life. I saw a talk recently, it's the same lady, this Lucy Horn, it's a TED talk, very, very lovely um, and quite powerful because she has done a lot of studies on resilience and that was her, always her work. But what she didn't expect was that she'd be, she would experience a great tragedy in her life and her young daughter died in a tragic car accident when she was only about 12 years old. And this lady, of course, then had to start actually applying all those things she'd been researching and teaching to so many other people. And she made a comment, let me make sure I get this right, because I noted it down, but it really struck me. She said... One of the pieces of wisdom that came to her, maybe I can't find it now. Let's have a look. Yeah, is don't lose what you have to what you've lost. And I just thought that was so powerful because at some point she realized that, you know, every time she was rolling and feeling suffocated and overwhelmed with grief. She was forgetting the blessings that she still did have in her life. She still did have two sons also and a, a loving marriage and all this wonderful work that was helping so many people. But if we're always focusing on what we don't have, we actually forget to notice that we have so many blessings, so much richness in our lives already. So I think this is a really helpful way to address that sort of jealousy and ill will. As for whether people can feel ill will at a distance, I would say it's not as likely because most probably you're not sitting down there and building it up on purpose, right? With loving kindness, we actually sit down and intentionally develop thoughts of love, thoughts of goodwill, and we intentionally project it outwards and bring those people to mind. When you're thinking of someone with ill will, it's usually a kind of, you're slipping into something unintentionally. You don't really want to be doing that. And you're not actually trying intentionally to spread that to the other person, you know. So I would think that there's not a lot of danger with that. I wouldn't worry too much about it. But on the other hand, um, it is important how we use our mind. So, for example, one of the suttas in the early Buddhist text says that we should think thoughts of loving kindness in public and in private. And the reason for that is that if we're always dwelling on the faults of somebody, when we meet them, we're less likely to have kind words, kind attitudes, kind intentions towards that person. And sometimes the person can feel that, of course, when you actually meet them. Whereas if you've been thinking thoughts, you know, like focusing on their strengths instead of their weaknesses, thinking thoughts of forgiveness, trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, then when you meet them, you're more likely to see them in that light. So it's more likely to translate into wholesome uh, speech and actions. And there's more integrity there between, you know, your mental world and your physical reality. But please don't blame yourself if you're not able to do that straight away. And I would not worry about them feeling the ill will from far away because you're not intentionally generating it. It's you that's suffering at that time. So sometimes give yourself some compassion too. Sometimes we're struggling and we think we've got to sort of change our attitude to others, but actually we're the ones who need our loving kindness the most at that time. 
So there's quite a lot of messages coming in in the box, so I think the next one is from Claire. Please forgive me if I miss any here because there's a lot and sometimes I'm not able to scroll very easily. Someone did tell me how to find this more easily but I forgot. It airs at 3.34pm if you look at the timing. Sorry? Claire's uh, messages oh, yeah, at 3.34pm. Oh yeah, I can see the... Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. I feel lucky that I tend towards seeing joy in the day-to-day -day naturally but I can really struggle with rejoicing for others, particularly those who I'm measuring myself against in some way and also for those who are successful but I judge it as not being a wholesome success, very acquisitive, perceived selfishness or ignorance. I then judge myself for feeling these things. I found it deeply interesting today, thank you. Great. I'm not sure that's so much of a question. I would just say I recognise all that. I think this is very, very natural. Um, and it's wonderful that you're so aware of how your mind works. Because also, again, in the suttas it says that, you know, it's easy to have loving kindness towards people who are friendly to us, right? Um, but for people who are less friendly towards us, we don't necessarily want their well-being. And it's much harder to rejoice in their success, of course. Right? It even goes so far as to say that you know, if somebody is an enemy of someone we love, they tend to become our enemy too because we have this sense of not only preserving and protecting ourselves but also protecting everyone we love. So if somebody says negative things about my teacher, I'm very quick to kind of put across a different perspective and to feel a little bit of you know, irritation towards that person. So this is good that you're noticing because um, this is where we can start to dissolve those boundaries. And yes, it's true that sometimes people seem to have acquired their happiness and success through unskillful means. And I think, you know, we can still have some sense of rejoicing for the success they have had. But also, if we do feel that they've been selfish, we can learn how not to be, right? We can even thank them for that because they're showing us, OK, it's possible to make gains, but there might be more wholesome ways to do it, you know, that I'd like to follow myself. Um, and also I think it's important to remind ourselves that we don't really know where other people are coming from. You know, we can think that they were being selfish or being um, ignorant or acquisitive and maybe that's true but there might have been a lot of other beautiful intentions and motivations there as well. So our Kamo is a really mixed bag. Um, one of the monks, <laughs> I don't really like mentioning this monk because he doesn't support bikinis. <laughs> but anyway, he is quite a good scholar, so a gentinicero. He, um, he put it in terms of having different uh, banks, karmic banks. So it's like we have seeds or, yeah, you could say seeds in different, I don't know, where would seeds live? In different plant pots. <laughs> so it's not like you have one karmic account, you have lots. So some of them might have a lot of beautiful seeds, some of them might have mixed seeds, some of them might have, you know, lower quality seeds. And you never know when the seeds are going to flower or what they're going to look like. So it may be that that person's good karma has come to ripen, but if there's selfishness there, then they will suffer for that. So they still need our goodwill, you know, our compassion, if they've done anything in that, uh, in an unskillful way. So let's see. Christelle would like to make a comment. Okay. On you. Sure. Okay. Hi, so Christelle. Thank you very much, uh, Venerable Chanda. I'm very happy to be here with all of you. And I wanted to make a comment um, about something that you said, maybe last week or the week before, uh, that really helped me very much. So I'm very grateful and I want to um, share it with you. Um, you said that whatever arises in you like feelings or emotions or thoughts then whatever it is uh, to meet it with metta with loving kindness and um, and that has really really helped me actually oh. so each time I have a thought or whatever instead of judging myself now I really try to tell myself to meet it with loving kindness with metta so Beautiful. I wanted to thank you for that oh. thank you Thank you, Crystal. Thank you for your practice and wisdom in taking that on board and uh, applying that. Yeah, because we can. It's easy to say these things, but it's another thing to actually apply them. Um, and that's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful because you're practicing metta for yourself. 
Very, very nice. And that in itself transforms these things. I think it's almost like after a while we realise if we're constantly trying to generate metta, we can more quickly and easily see when we're off course. You know, it becomes more obvious when we have a harmful thought that we don't react to with metta. It's like, ouch! Uh, and then we bring it back in and get back on that flow. So, fantastic. You're carving out deep grooves in the mind, deep grooves of, uh, of metta. So you'll be following those paths more and more. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. So, there's another question here. This morning you talked about purification. I think it was purifying the intentions or perhaps the mind. Could you say more about that, please? Okay, yeah. I think that might have been in the first talk. And it's a word that I don't often use, simply because it's, it can imply, when used to talk about the mind, that there's some kind of pure natural state of mind. And I would rather see everything as sort of inner flow and in a flux but what it really means is just moving more towards wholesome intentions wholesome mental states and by wholesome or pure if you want um, I mean states of mind which bring around your happiness your benefit and the benefit and happiness of others so one of the suttas I was referring to earlier is called the two types of thought it's Majjhima Nikaya 19 and it's really worth looking into because it's a beautiful sutta that, um, that describes the three right intentions and then the three unskillful intentions, which are the opposites. And those three right types of thought or intention are exactly the same as the second factor of the noble path. They're thoughts or intentions of renunciation. That means letting go, uh, making peace with, if you like, experience. Um, letting go of the unskillful, you know, uh, not owning, not controlling or possessing other people or, you know, unskillful thoughts. And then the second one is um, non-ill will, which is a synonym for loving kindness. The opposite of ill will is loving kindness, right? It's not that without ill will you're just blank and flat. <laughs> ill will is the obstacle to love. So as we purify our minds from ill will, this love starts to arise and we start to have thoughts of loving kindness. And then the last one is uh, thoughts of non-cruelty, avihimsaka sankapa, avihimsaka, which is uh, the same word as ahimsa, non-violence, from Mahatma Gandhi. Um, so they're thoughts which are kind, which are gentle, which are not cruel or, or mean, yeah? Sometimes we can have thoughts that we don't identify as ill will, but we have thoughts that are actually a little bit harsh or thoughts that push ourselves a bit too much. Oh, come on, get on with it, you know, do better. Oh, for goodness sake, can't you stop procrastinating? This kind of thought, it's not very gentle, it's not very kind. So the opposite of that, of course, is thoughts of compassion, like, oh, I see you're struggling a bit, it's okay, take your time, you know. Give yourself a break, you really deserve it, you've been working hard. This kind of thought and intention. So the Buddha says that when you have um, the pure intentions, the, the right thoughts, you can't simultaneously have the wrong ones. So it's like you're replacing the negative one with a positive one and the two cannot coexist. So it's beautiful, it's a beautiful message because every time you have a thought of loving kindness or um, joy or generosity, um, goodwill, at that moment, in a sense, you can say you're purifying your mind, right? You're creating that groove in the mind of loving kindness, like a positive channel, a positive direction that you're more and more likely to flow along. And I do think that um, it works more in the positive direction because as human beings, we do tend to veer away from suffering and we do tend to seek our happiness. So as soon as we notice we're harming ourselves, we do have this tendency to want to rectify that and to move towards something more wholesome. It's just a matter of practice, really, and being patient with ourselves. So I have one from Vero, somebody, somebody, um, but I only have half of it. Uh, but I think this, this half of it anyway is very good. I feel lonely and want to overcome that. Do you think I should just continue to put my thoughts towards that? 
So I'm not sure if you mean towards the loneliness or towards overcoming it, but I would say with loneliness or with any emotion that we feel is afflictive or painful, um, there's always this tendency to want to overcome it, which is very natural. But that can be a little step too far because until we've really met it, um, until we've made peace with it and accepted it, um, the wish to overcome it can be slightly aversive. And also we might be missing out on the lessons that it has to teach us, right? So I would say the first step with any um, emotion, including difficult emotions, is to learn to meet them, first of all. Learn to familiarize and to get, you know, come into a more wholesome relationship with the loneliness. See if you can really feel into it and with compassion. So you don't just go in with mindfulness, okay, I must stay with it, I must kind of focus on it. No, you soften the mind and you, you know, in a sense you can evoke um, a compassionate presence. And there's different ways to do that. Sometimes I like to imagine myself as a very compassionate being or a compassionate presence. Maybe that means tapping into um, a more mature or wise version of myself, some aspect that is there, you know, and that I can intuit. And then just imagining living through that, seeing life through that, and embracing the loneliness from that perspective. And then when you get familiar and comfortable with that loneliness, you might find that there's something underneath it, you know, or there's something more to it that needs to be seen. And gradually, the more we can open and make peace the more resilience and strength we have in our mind. And yeah, often loneliness, for me anyway, is a sign that I'm out of touch with myself. So simply being in touch with how I feel can actually be one of the antidotes to that loneliness. And anyway, when we make peace with things, we don't need to get rid of them anymore because <laughs> we're okay with them. And ironically, that's usually exactly when they disappear. <laughs> So the path is always somehow through rather than beyond. Okay, I'm finding one from Michael and Soraya. I'm doing a gratitude diary with my 14 year old son. He struggles to identify anything at all to feel grateful about as he doesn't realize that everything is to be grateful about. Yeah. He especially overlooks the small things. Have you any advice for helping people gently open their eyes to appreciation? Yeah, I suppose my first thought is that that's very natural at age 14, at least. You're ama I'm amazed that he'll do it with you because if my mum would have asked me to do something like that when I was 15, I'd have said, no way, why should I do that with you? I was not very nice as a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, what's the to be grateful about? You know, oh, I'm just fed up. <laughs> so actually, I think the fact he's doing that is already really wonderful. So be grateful that he's doing it. And um, perhaps just tell him that it's fine if he can't think of anything. It's actually fine. You know, make sure he doesn't feel any pressure to come up with anything. And also maybe give him some examples of really simple things like, I'm grateful that I can stand up and walk downstairs without, I don't know, falling over or I can put the kettle on without having to first kind of go to the well and bring the water up. Um, anything at all. And, and yeah, I think the important thing is that he doesn't feel pressure um, and that he feels he's okay the way he is, even when he's not grateful. Um, but the fact he's doing it, I think, is really fantastic. and. I think parents and children have an, a special relationship <laughs> and sometimes they don't like to admit that actually it's very helpful <laughs> because I notice with my mum and dad that um, they've started to come sometimes to some of the meditations that my teachers do, usually not my meditations, although they do sometimes listen to a talk that I've given, but they, they don't tell me, you know, because if they tell me they might feel that I'll ask them to come again. So they keep it kind of quiet and then if I say, oh, so how was it? They say, oh yes, it was fine, it was fine. Yeah, not bad, not bad, you know. And then my sister tells me, oh, they said it was brilliant, they could do that every week. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really interesting, isn't it? So I think sometimes, 
especially at that age, he probably needs to have a bit of um, freedom to feel like he can still be grumpy if he needs to be. So, but well done. I think the fact he'll do it with you is fantastic. It shows you're a very good parent. Right, I would like to go to a couple of people with their hands up because we haven't had many folks speak. Um, I'm not sure who did it, who had their hand up first. Maybe Catherine knows. Hi. Hello. Hi, Miriam. Hey, I'm learning a lot. Um, I have a question, and you may have, you may have touched on it at points during today, but in my relationship, um, my partner, the thing I love most about him is that he's very free spirited, and he's lived this wild, crazy life, um, which I love. But at the same time, I find myself feeling resentful sometimes because, um, yeah, because I, I didn't, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I'm getting emotional. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, and sometimes he wants to share his stories with me and tell me things. And I want to listen, but I can't help but yeah. feel like I, um, yeah. Yeah. And because of that, sometimes he doesn't feel like he can be himself around me because it affects me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was wondering um, how to deal with that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, thank you so much for asking. I really admire your courage in bringing that up. And I feel, I can feel how that might be difficult. <laughs> Absolutely. I can feel that. And I think, you know, the fact that you were getting emotional about it just now suggests that you may be fighting your own emotions a little bit and sort of stigmatizing those feelings a little bit feeling that you shouldn't be th thinking that way and perhaps what needs to happen is sorry yeah. uh, sorry i don't i don't want to feel this way i want to be happy and supportive. i know i know yeah but the thing is perhaps those feelings need to be felt perhaps they need some space and that would be the most healing way to to address them, to actually accept that they're there and to feel that you're allowed to actually feel them. And that doesn't mean you don't feel happy for your partner. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means we're, we're complex human beings and we can have both. You know, we can have both. We can feel happy for someone and at the same time feel sad that, you know, maybe there's something in us that we haven't explored or places that we haven't had the freedom to travel to and experience. So I would suggest maybe talking together and explaining that when you're not in that state of mind, right, at another time, and maybe explaining that you are really happy for this person and you really do want to um, hear about their life, but you feel that you also need space to feel what you do and perhaps you could together agree to allow that to, to come up and to actually um, discuss that instead to allow it space within that relationship, you know. I don't know if that makes sense, but I feel that by trying to sort of push it down and then feeling bad about having it and feeling guilty and, you know, worrying that he's going to feel suppressed in some way, it's just going to carry on rolling in there, you know, and, and kind of increasing in strength. And maybe if he understands it's not a negation of your joy for him in any way but it's just something else that also needs some space then um then you could sort of learn to navigate that together at different times yeah i hope that helps a little bit i'll take one more question because i do want to give um everyone chance to connect together so maybe we can what do you think catherine should we go to sarah um Thank you very much for today. Um, I was uh, doing the um, uh, Mudita practice and, um, you know, breathing it in for myself, breathing it out for others. And, you know, after some time, the sort of myself and others distinction kind of disappears. Mm. And um, when that distinction disappears, it kind of really interesting um, but I tend to um, topple <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm just wondering 
yeah, I sort of lose my bearings. Well, I suppose yeah. that's the point, isn't it? <laughs> it's, uh, the bearings are not the self. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know, but I'm mm -hmm. um, yeah. wondering if... if yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think um, whether we get to that sort of state through mudita or through general practice, say with the breath, it's always a sort of time when the familiar starts to disappear and we start to enter slightly less familiar territory. And the usual question from people at that point is, what do I do now? Because like you say, the bearings aren't so clear, the object is not so clear anymore. And at that point, the way I've understood um, the process is that it's actually most helpful to just stay still, to just stay with what you're experiencing if you can um, and notice that urge to sort of want to know what to do next and find your bearings again and just stay with that sense of being slightly less in control perhaps and after a while it's like Ajahn Brahm uses a nice simile, he says it's like entering a dark room straight from the daylight and at first you can't see very much you don't really know where you are because there's no familiar landmarks but if you just stay there and, and stay still and stay quiet and trust the process slowly your eyes start to accustom to the dark and slowly you start to be able to see a little bit more and the mind gets energized because that experience is much subtler than the one you're used to and at first we can't see um, very much there but after a while, you start to tune up to something subtler, like a subtler sense of joy and contentment that's there. And at that point, the mindfulness can start to grow. So I would say just see if you can just stay with it. Notice that tendency to want to, again, get back to the familiar. Um, and just trust in the process. Of course, if that becomes like actually scary or difficult, you can always gently, gently bring yourself back into the sense of being grounded, embodied, maybe back to the breath. But um, yeah, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So, so just see if you can stay present at that time. Yeah. Good. Now, there is one little question. I'm going to quickly go to it just because it looks like this person has been meditating a long time. And then we'll go into the little groups. I've been meditating for years and enjoy it, but the joy and deep states seem out of reach. I can't seem to get out of my own way to allow them to happen. Have you any advice? Yeah, I mean, I ask this to Ajahn Brahm sometimes because they're, you know, not always accessible to me. And he generally points out that there's a craving there. If, if there's a blockage, there's a craving, there's a wanting there. And especially if you've been meditating a long time, this can be, you know, we don't really notice it, but we do have this idea of how far we should be and how far it should be going. And, you know, I should be able to access this more easily. And, and there is a subtle craving there. So the contentment is not deep enough. That's the thing. We're looking for joy in deep states, but the way into those states is through contentment with where we are. So again, it's not about going further or going deeper, it's about going inward to where we are already and opening our eyes to, to the contentment that's there now. You know, sometimes it seems like not much is happening, there's not much joy, but it's just because we're looking for something different. We're looking for the kind of joy that we're familiar with, which is very obvious, but even a little bit coarse. But actually there can be something, even if it's just a mild sense of peace, a mild sense of relaxation. And if we can really embrace that and, and genuinely develop a perception of good enough, like this really is good enough. I'm here, I'm free from coarser afflictions, I've got nothing to particularly worry about, I can just use this time to relax. Then the contentment can deepen and after a while you'll find the joy will start to grow. But as soon as you look for it to grow, then you're moving out of that parameter of contentment <laughs> and, you know, into the future. So always going inward into this present moment and looking for what is there rather than what's not, I would say. Yeah.